this throughout the ages of time. He will continue to do this. This is the way that God operates. He chooses some. He does not choose others. And that's what he's going to make the case of here in, in this text. Now, I, I want to do this just for the sake of uh, refreshing your memory. Go to Romans chapter 11 again, just two chapters over. Romans chapter 11. And I want to pick up with that thought again that they are not all Israel who are of Israel. You'll remember that, uh, this we didn't share with you, but in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, uh, the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, for, excuse me, he says, um, for one is not a Jew who is one outwardly. So he's not a Jew who is one outwardly. He goes on, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter. So he says, he makes a very clear distinction. You're, he's not a Jew who is simply one outwardly. Well, what would that be? What would be an outward Jew? A physical descendant of Abraham, right, is a Jew. Right? He says he's not a Jew who is just simply one outwardly, who has a circumcision that is an outward circumcision in the flesh, but he says he is a Jew. In other words, a true Jew, according to Paul's teaching, is one who is one inwardly, whose circumcision is not in the flesh only, but in the heart, who is in the spirit, not in the letter of the law. When he talks about in the spirit, not in the letter of the law, he's referring again to regeneration, conversion. That the spirit of God has regenerated the individual. It's not by the letter of the law or the keeping of the letter of the law that one is saved, but they are saved through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. It's not of the letter, it's of the spirit. So you can see this principle again that we're trying to get over to you, and we'll see it again in Romans 11, is that while there is an outward Jew, there's an inward Jew. There's a visible Israel, there's a invisible Israel. There is a, a physical Israel and there is a spiritual Israel. Just like we, we said this, just like not all Israel is Israel, we made this, this uh, connection last week, not all the church is the church. Right? Not everybody that's in the visible church is part of the invisible church. Not everybody that's part of the physical physical seen church is a part of the true church as the true church is made up of who? Believers in Christ Jesus, right? You could follow traditions and the customs of, 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 of the church and attend church and all of those things but if it's not in the heart, if it's not in the spirit, if it's not the circumcision of the heart, well then it's just routine it's just duty, it's just legalism, it's just the letter of the law and it's not in the spirit and so He's making this, uh, this statement here in Romans chapter 11, proving that not all Israel is Israel. I say then, verse 1, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite. In other words, he's trying to make a proof that, that just because not all of Israel is saved, doesn't mean there's no Israelite that's saved. He's an Israelite himself. He is saved. He's a believer. He's of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Now this is key right here. Who did he not cast away? His people whom he what? Foreknew. So he's, again, he's not talking about all of Israel. He's talking about his people whom he foreknew. Those whom he foreloved. Those whom he selected before the foundation of the world. Those he did not cast away. He's not referring to all of Israel, but a group, a remnant within Israel. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not, bailed, have not bowed their knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So notice, he refers back to the time of the law and the prophets, and he refers back to a time where Elijah thought he was al alone left, but there was 7,000 more prophets who had not bowed their knee to Baal. 
But what does that also mean? It also means there was a bunch of others that did bow their knee to Baal. But God had kept or reserved a remnant, 7,000 that had not bowed their knee to Baal, that were true servants of God, true followers of God. And so he refers to this, uh, that in the present time, that's Paul's time, that there's a remnant according to the election of grace. Now always remember this, that the election is an election of what? Grace. And if you can keep that in your mind this whole time, Romans 9 will be much simpler to understand. It's not election based on works that we do. It's election based on the sheer grace of God. That God has chosen people of His own free grace. And if by grace, then it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. It's just simply a way of saying that uh, grace and works are diametrically opposed. You're saved one way or the other, but not both. So either you're saved by grace or you're saved by works, but you can't be saved by both. And obviously we're saved by grace. It's referred to as an election of grace. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it and the rest were blinded. Now notice very carefully in this verse that he separates Israel. Israel has not obtained it, the election of grace, but the elect have obtained it. So he's making a clear distinction that not all of Israel, so if you can kind of picture a big circle here, the physical descendants of Abraham, the, the physical descendants of Abraham, this is the biggest circle, but within that big circle is the little circle, which is the true followers of God, which is the true ones that have been called by God, that have been elected by Him, that have been chosen by Him. They are the spiritual descendants of Abraham. Okay? We, we looked at this um, Galatians chapter, excuse me, Romans chapter, let's go back to Romans chapter 9 first. Then I'll remind you of Galatians chapter 3 in just a moment. He says, nor are they all children, verse 7 of Romans 9, Romans 9, verse 7. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. So he's making a distinction again. You have the children of the flesh, but the children of the flesh are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as seed. Now, he, he immediately talks about Abraham, and we, we said before, and we're not going to elaborate on this in great detail, but we said to you that the, the mistake that the Jews made, the errant thought that they had, was that just simply by being a physical descendant of Abraham, by being a physical Jew, by being a part of physical Israel, by virtue of their circumcision and by virtue of their traditions that have been passed down for thousands of gener for thousands of years, multiple generations, they believed that they were automatically saved. Right? That was the that was the concept that they had. So Paul is obliterating that idea. He is teaching them that salvation is not hereditary. You are not saved by your your family tree. You're not saved, just like today you can say, we're not saved by baptism, just like they were not saved by circumcision. We're not saved by our family tree any more than they were saved by their family tree. It is not according to those things of the flesh, it is according to the election of God or the choice of God. And so you have this children of flesh versus the children of God. Now, now let me ask you this question because he says here, He's obviously talking now about Isaac, obviously talking about Ishmael. He says, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Let me ask you a question. Was, was Ishmael a child of Abraham? Yes, he was, right? He was a physical descendant of Abraham. Uh, after Sarah dies, we know that uh, Abraham married again, Keturah, and, and he had several more sons through Keturah. Were they children of Abraham? Right. They, they, were, they were the physical descendants of Abraham as much as Isaac was. 
but were they the children of God? No. They were not the children of promise. Who, who said, here, let me ask you a question now. Got to get you thinking. Who made, who made the decision who would be the child of promise? Did, did, did God did, right? Isn't it God who said in Isaac, your seed shall be called? God said that. It is God who made the choice or made the distinction as to who would be the children of promise, the children of God. It is not Isaac who determined that he would be the child of promise. It's not Abraham that determined that it would be Isaac that would be the child of promise. Remember, Abraham was asking God to allow Ishmael to live before him, to allow him to be the one. By that time, uh, you know, Ishmael was 13 years old. Spent 13 years with him as father and son. He says, just let him live before you. Let him be the one. See, Abraham wanted something different, right? He was willing. He was working, striving with God that Ishmael would be the one. And God said, no. In Isaac, your seed shall be called. So it is God who made the choice, made the distinction, who would be the child of promise and who would not be the child of promise. So he's the one that determined who would be the children of God and who would not be the children of God, but simply the children of the flesh. So he's trying to get them to think about it. Hey, wait a minute. Just because they were physical descendants of Abraham didn't mean they were the children of God. It didn't mean that they were automatically saved just by being the physical descendants of Abraham. For, for this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. So again, uh, we see this, this, again, God speaking, God declaring, God decreeing who would be the chosen one. He it, it didn't say through Hagar, but through who? Sarah, through your wife, Sarah. So we know this again to be Isaac. So even though he had uh, physical descendants, children of the flesh, as the Bible says, they were not the children of God. It was God that made the distinction and the choice as to whom would be the children of God. Um, I was going to say this a, a moment ago in trying to again make this clear, clear in our minds that here's the physical Israel, the physical descendants of Israel, of, of Abraham, but then within that is the spiritual Israel, the, the spiritual descendants of Abraham, the true believers, the true followers of God. And, and usually we think about Galatians chapter 3, verse 7, because it says that um, only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. Right? Only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. How many of you are okay with saying that? Right? I think everybody is okay saying only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. Right? If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise? Right? Galatians 3.29. Everybody is okay with saying that only those who believe in Christ are the true descendants of, or the true followers, uh, excuse me, the true descendants of Abraham, true Israel, spiritual Israel. But Paul is going to take it a step further and he's going to point out not faith, but he's going to point out what preceded faith or what caused faith, and he's going to talk about election. And this is where people choke, right? Uh, let me say this in, in, uh, in all sincerity. The, the doctrine of election, unconditional election that we're teaching, it is difficult to understand. And this is not the milk of the word. This is the meat of the word. It is difficult to understand. It is not the easiest subject to understand. In fact, I'm, I'm quite uh, proud of you that you've been able to endure with me for uh, all of these weeks and months on teaching this very subject because there's a lot of places that you, you could not even uh, teach on this without people getting upset and leaving. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the, the majority of you today is an absolute denial of Romans chapter 9 and the teaching of unconditional election. Um, so I applaud you for that. Uh, but I, I, think, I think more than it is difficult to understand, it's more difficult to accept. It's difficult for people to accept 
that God chose some to be saved and God did not choose others to be saved. And that the only reason why any of us are saved is because God chose to save us. And if God did not choose to save us, none of us would be saved. Boy, we struggle with that. I think it's harder to accept than it is harder to understand. Does that make sense to you? It's difficult for people to accept that God saves some but doesn't save everyone. And that the only reason any of us are saved is because God decided to save us. And the only reason other people are not saved is because God decided not to save them. And that's where we struggle with this. And so as we get into this, this next portion, he's going to start to talk about uh, Jacob and Esau in verses 11 through 13. He's going to talk about Jacob and Esau. We're going to read the whole text first and then we'll make some comments. Let's back up to verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. That's a, that's a tough pill to swallow, isn't it? That, that, that whole passage right there. Um, let me ask you a question before we talk about it. Number one, how many of you believe in here that everyone is going to be saved? Does anyone in here believe that everyone in the world is going to be saved? What's your answer? No. No. Good, that's, that's an orthodox, biblical, Christian view. Not everyone is going to be saved. Let's establish that. All right? So, in light of that question, the second question is this. So you believe, and I'm asking you, so you believe that some people will go to heaven and some people will go to hell? Right? Okay. So that's two orthodox views that are based in the, the biblical Christian faith. Not everyone is saved. Some are going to heaven. Some are going to hell. Not an easy fact to deal with, but a truth nonetheless. Now let me ask you the third question, and this is the million dollar question. Why do you believe that? Why do you believe that not everyone is going to be saved? And why do you believe that some are going to heaven and some are going to hell. Why do you believe it? Do you believe that the cause of that is God's choice? Or do you believe that the, that the, the cause of that is human choice? And how you answer that will determine whether you believe Romans chapter 9 or not. Is it God's choice or is it human choice? If you're a Calvinist, you believe it's God's choice. If you're an Arminian, you believe it's human choice. And that's the difference. We all believe, not everyone's going to be saved, we all believe some are going to heaven, some are going to hell. But why do you believe it is the issue. Do you believe it's because of God's choice or human choice? And what does he teach here in Romans chapter 9, verse number 11? For the children not yet being born, how many things can you do before you're born? Anything? Anything that you can do to merit anything from God? No. Before being born, not having done any good or evil. So it's not because Jacob was good and, and, and um, Esau was evil. It wasn't because Ishmael was evil and Isaac was good. It wasn't because of that. It had nothing to do with anything good or evil that either one of them had done. But that the purpose of God, according to election might stand, not of works, but of what? Him who calls. So, so why, why did God choose Jacob and not Esau? Because Jacob was a good guy. Because he saw that Jacob would believe. No. Why did he not choose Esau? Because he saw Esau was going to be a bad guy? 
No, that, that's not in the text at all. It was before either of them had done anything good or evil, before either of them had been born, God already made a choice. So God's choice predates their actual birth. So that there would be no confusion as to whether it was God's choice or their works. It was solely God's choice. Now if Paul was teaching conditional election, conditional election says that uh, God looks down through the ages of time and he sees who's going to choose him and therefore he chooses those who choose him. That's conditional election. Unconditional election says that God simply chooses whom he chooses because he chooses. It has nothing to do with the individuals he's choosing. It has everything to do with God's own choice. God's own free grace. Not the individual's. Now, I like that he uses Jacob and Esau as an example because Jacob and Esau are twins. Now, you can't get any closer to home than this, right? Twins. See, they, they could have said uh, in response to, to Isaac and Ishmael, well, you know, Isaac and Ishmael had different mothers. But they had the same father, Abraham, but they did not have the same mother. They could have said, well, they were born, you know, years apart. <coughs> Uh, they could have said any number of things, but here he says, well, Jacob and Esau, they're twins. Not only the same father, the same mother, they're born at the same time, they grow up in the same house, and God chooses one, but he does not choose the other. He, he removes, hear me, in this passage he removes all natural physical distinctions. Twins. Removes all distinctions. But there's one distinction left in verse number 11. And that one distinction is not found in Jacob or Esau, but the distinction is found in God's choice. That's the distinction. The reason why Jacob was chosen and Esau was not was because of God's choice, not because of anything within Jacob or Esau. Now parallel it to us. God chose you not because of anything in you. God chose us not because of anything about us. Not because we were better than other people. Not because we were smarter than other people. Not because we would get it quicker than somebody else would. Not because we were more moral than other people. Jacob was not better than Esau. Jacob was a lying, cheating scoundrel. <laughs> right? I mean, you can't go to their lives. I mean, Abraham was not a saint. Why, why did God, you could get mad about that. Why did God choose Abraham? Why didn't he choose Billy Bob? Billy Bob was married and he probably didn't marry his sister like Abraham did. And he probably was able to have kids and maybe already had kids already. Why didn't God choose Billy Bob? Why did he choose Abraham? Because God wanted to choose Abraham. That's why he chose Abraham. Nothing in Abraham made God choose Abraham. God chose Abraham because God wanted to choose Abraham. God chose uh, Isaac because he wanted to choose Isaac. God chose Jacob because he wanted to choose Jacob. Are you following me so far? Verse number 12, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now the majority of you today is that, you know, God loves everyone the same, right? Isn't that the majority of you? Uh, most churches today would say, well, God loves everyone unconditionally. Well, it is true that God loves everybody. That is true. But it is not true that God loves everybody the same. I'm going to prove it to you. Go with me to John chapter 17, and I'm probably going to close with these thoughts. Go to John chapter 17, uh, and let's hear Jesus praying. Now, you'll remember this passage. It is true again that God loves everybody. God loves the whole world. But it is also true, I guess it would be a good way to say it, that God 
has a special salvific, saving, covenant love for those whom he has chosen that he does not have for everyone else. Okay? How many of you have children? How many of you love all children? So everybody loves every children, right? Every, every child. But do you love every child the same way you love your children? How many of you men love every woman? <laughs> I'm probably going to get you all in trouble, right? Well, sure. Right? There's different types of love, is there not? And you should love everyone, right? So you can love every woman. But how many of you love every woman the way that you love your wife? All right, ladies, I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> I want you to think you're getting off. How many of you ladies love every man? No? <laughs> I hate most of them, right? <laughs> well, the truth is being told today, I guess, right? Right? But you don't love every man the way that you love your husband. There's a special love that you have. And we'll teach on this another time when we talk about a different subject. There's different types of love that the Bible talks about. You know, I can love Marilyn, but I'm not going to love Marilyn the same way that I love my wife. And Bernie can love my wife, but he can't love my wife the same way that he loves his wife. Does that make sense to you? All right. So God can love the whole world, but he can have a special, electing, salvific, choosing love for his people. So in John chapter 17, Jesus, you know, discriminating Jesus here, always choosing some people and not choosing other people. He's praying a prayer here, and we looked at this before. Uh, I'm just going to refresh your thinking here. Uh, verse number 9 I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. Now question, who's the them he's praying for? His chosen ones, right? He's going to clarify that here in this passage again. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. Who's he praying for? Those whom the Father has given to him. He's not praying for the whole world. He's making that clear. And we said to you before when we went through this passage that seven times within this prayer, Jesus uses these words, you have given to me. You have given him. He's, giving, he's always talking about those whom the Father has given to the Son. Now let's skip down to verse number uh, 22. Now he's praying for his disciples, those who are given from the Father to the Son. But now he's also praying for those of us who believe through the word of the apostles, through the word of his disciples. And he says, the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So the Father loves us with the same love that He loves the Son. And who is the them that He's praying this prayer for again? Those whom the Father has given to Him. He's not praying for the whole world. He's not saying that the Father loves the whole world the way that He loves the Son, but He loves the elect, the chosen of God, with the same love that he loves the Son. Amen. So what does he mean? Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. And we're getting ready to close. I'm just going to make another comment, I believe. What does he mean? Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. It's not very often you hear about God's hatred, is it? Everything today is about God's love. Nothing about God's hate. Well, keep it in the context of, of God making a choice. The, 
people you love, isn't that right? The people you love, you do things for them that you do not do for other people. We could use, again, the husband-wife illustration. We could use the, the father, mother, and children example. Right? You do things for your kids that you do not do for other kids. And, and we see the same principle here in effect that God does for Jacob. He gives to Jacob what he does not give to Esau. He gives to Jacob, he selects Jacob, he chooses Jacob, he gives Jacob this salvific love, this choice of him that he does not give to Esau. So you could say it this way, his love of Jacob is active, it's aggressive, it's assertive, right? None of us would come to Christ if God did not intervene in our life, if God did not come after us. Through the preaching of the gospel, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, no one would ever call on the name of the Lord to be saved. None of us. So he gave that to Jacob, but what did he not do for Esau? He didn't do that for Esau. He, he was active in his love of Jacob and passive toward Esau so that he just passed over Esau and he did not give to Esau that which he gave to Jacob. He did not choose Esau, but he chose Jacob. He gave to one what he did not give to the other. That's all it's saying here is that God is active in his love of those whom he has chosen and he is passive. He passes over those whom he has not. Because if he passes over us, he, has, he doesn't have to, he, God does not have to actively hate us and do bad to us or do evil to us because that would make him sinful and make him the tempter. He doesn't have to do that. We talked that before, right? That if you leave humans to themselves, they will self-destruct. They will sin. And what does sin bring about? Death. The wages of sin is death. If you leave people alone, they will ultimately self-destruct. So the only people that will ever be saved are those for whom God intervenes on their behalf. And if God doesn't intervene, if God passes over them, they will never be saved. Now he's going to get into the next verse, and we're going to talk about this next week, so we're not going to start here. But he brings up now, the question comes up, how is that fair? How is that fair? Well, let me leave you with this thought. Is there injustice with God? Is there unrighteousness with God? Is the question he's going to ask. Is, isn't that unfair of God? He says, certainly not. Or God forbid. See, if you think it's unfair, then you're thinking that God is dealing with people that are just beautiful, lovely, kind, holy, just good people. But God is dealing with lawbreakers, chronic lawbreakers that have broken his commands time and time and time again. So if God was going to be fair, what would happen to everybody? Come on, if, if God was going to be fair, if you want fairness, we would all go to where? Go to heaven. That's right. You don't want fairness. If you want fairness, none of us. None of us deserve salvation. None of us deserve to go to heaven. If you want what is fair, that's... See, God is not dealing with people that are nice, good-looking, kind people. He's dealing with lawbreakers. And here's a question I want to leave you with. I want you to think about this throughout the week, okay? What is the default response to lawbreakers? Justice or mercy? It's easy, right? Justice. Justice is the default response to lawbreakers. You're caught speeding. You cannot tell the police officer, you have to give me mercy. You have to let me off the hook. You have to let me go. You have to just give me a warning and let me go. You can't say that. Because the default response to lawbreaking is what? Justice. Can you imagine if we lived in a world where the default response to law breaking was mercy? 
We would live in a lawless society, a lawless world, where the rule of law meant nothing and there would be no safety, there would be no peace whatsoever in our life. We live that way. But somehow we want God to be this wishy-washy, limp-wristed, no backbone, let everything go. He can't be the sovereign ruler. He can't be the judge. He can't be the Lord of all. He's just got to be this big bucket of mush. And that's the kind of God that people want to serve today. But God can choose who He wants to be merciful to, and that's what we'll get into next week. And He can choose who He wants to harden. He can choose whom He wants to save, and He can choose whom He does not want to save. It's His prerogative, because we're going to find out later, He is the potter, and we're just a lump of clay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we realize that uh, these things are not easy to accept. They're not easy to hear. Uh, and it comes down to the simple fact that we just have to believe that which is recorded in Scripture. To realize that we are not uh, as great as what the humanists have taught us that we are. That we must believe that uh, the biblical view of man is the true view. That we should view ourselves in the light of Scripture. That we are fallen creatures not elevated creatures. And that only by your mercy, which is freely given according to your own will, can save any of us. And it is that which we do not deserve. It's not that which we will for or run for. But it is of you who shows mercy to us. Help us to understand these things and to learn and to grow in these truths. In Jesus' name. Amen.